Stadiums are among the most iconic, eye-catching structures of the modern world. Symbols of local and national pride, cauldrons of passion, where legends of sport compete, and where stars of entertainment draw massive crowds. No other type of structure keeps so many people so close together and in such an emotionally charged atmosphere. So when disaster strikes, the effect can be catastrophic. The fire spread faster than a man can run. And disasters have struck again and again. Some people are killed not by their fall, but by people falling on top of them. Turning public spectacles into national tragedies. I felt in fear of my life. I thought I was going to die. Today, ambitious new stadiums are rising up on every continent. The engineers behind them are striving to prevent the disasters of the future by learning from what went wrong in the past. If ever any disaster happens, then we need to learn from it. In short, every new stadium under construction is being built from disaster. When disaster strikes at a stadium, the tragedy is played out in the full gaze of public horror. And during the past century, more than 1,600 people have lost their lives in stadiums across the world. 1902, a terracing collapse in Glasgow, Scotland, left 26 dead. 1985, Heysel Stadium in Belgium, a riot by hooligans led to 39 deaths. In the same year, a stand in Bradford, England, went up in flames, claiming 56 lives. And in 1989, 96 soccer fans were crushed to death at the Hillsborough Stadium in England. But from these tragedies, engineers have learned there are three main dangers their structures must be designed to prevent. Structural collapse, fire and crowd crushes. New stadiums are determined to solve these problems through a mixture of pioneering technology, strategic planning and radical design. All of these can be seen at the state-of-the-art mega stadium currently being built in Valencia, southern Spain. The city soccer team is abandoning its old home, the Mestalla, because it's just not up to 21st century standards and has no room left to expand. The new Mestalla, on the outskirts of the city, will offer unrivaled views for 20,000 more fans, a capacity of 75,000. And uniquely, the city's geography has actually shaped the eye-catching exterior. Mapped onto the roof is Valencia's River Turia. Now, our client here in Valencia has said they want the world's best stadium. Antes que nada, tiene que ser un estadio donde se juegue bien al fútbol y donde el Valencia gane casi todos o todos los partidos. The corners are already marked out. And builders are working day and night to complete the job in record-breaking time. No stadium of this size has ever been built so quickly. But neither the tight deadline nor the beauty of the design is the most important mission for the new Mestalla's engineers. Their ultimate responsibility is to make sure the fans who'll soon be flocking here can do so without fear for their safety. Because when disaster strikes, people who come to watch a game find themselves fighting for their lives. May the 11th, 1985. 11,000 people were packed into Valley Parade, the stadium of English soccer team Bradford City. Just before half time, some fans in the main stand noticed a problem. I was sitting with my father in law. He said to me, It was hot underneath the seat. I lowered my hand, and indeed, it, it was. 
We saw a little bit of smoke uh, coming up. The immediate suspicion were, were hooligans were uh, setting fire to paper. At that point, the police motioned to us to go to the back of the stand. Less than a minute later, a whole block of seats was ablaze and the match was halted. People started jumping up out of the seats rather smartish-like and there was the panic, first bit of panic started. We got up, we walked along a few seats to the gap in the back wall, which took you onto a walkway. The smoke got pretty thick. That back walkway got very congested. And then the smoke came down, the thick black smoke, which as it was as if someone had turned the lights out. You could hear people screaming, shouting. I got down on my hands and knees because it was so thick. I actually crawled over someone, whether they were alive or not, I don't know. The toxic smoke was now poisoning the trapped crowd, and with each second, the flames were coming closer. By this time, I was getting to a stage of panic, and um, then it was as if someone had switched the lights on, and I looked back to where the light was coming from, and it was the fireball was coming along the corridor. The stand's roof was now on fire. It's described by an onlooker as the fire spreading along the stand faster than a man can run. Those of us who were up there could just about walk, so that for many of us, the fire has spread above us, be below us, and beyond us. As soon as I saw the fireball, I stood up and started to run. I thought, this is it, you've got to do something. And it is true what they say, your life flashes before you. Both Peter and Paul made a desperate dash back through the burning stands, down to the pitch. That the temperature rose as high as 900 degrees, which I understand is something like the heat in a crematorium. Even on the pitch, it was hot enough for some people's clothes to spontaneously combust. The whole period from that first flame to the entire stand being on fire top to bottom took a fraction over four minutes. If you weren't out before that four minutes, you were never getting out. Fifty-six people died. Immediately afterwards, investigators began to search for the causes of the disaster. They had two big questions. Why had so many people failed to escape the burning stand? But first of all, how had the fire taken hold so quickly? One factor was obvious. The 80-year-old stand was built mostly from wood. Forensic analysis showed a cigarette or match had fallen through a gap in the floorboards. In the space underneath, litter had been allowed to build up. Old newspapers and food wrappers were easy to ignite and the fire could build invisibly before anyone knew of its existence. In the immediate aftermath of the Bradford fire, wooden stands across the UK were condemned and demolished. Nearly half the clubs in the English Football League had to close some of their stadiums. And since Bradford, any new stadium has to make sure every single material is fireproof or protected. Jay Parrish, one of the designers of the new Valencia Arena, has been creating stadiums for over 30 years. What went wrong at Bradford has shaped everything he's built since. If ever any disaster happens, then we need to learn from it. We've got to find out why did it happen, and more importantly, what do we have to do for the stadiums we're designing now to make sure that we don't make the same mistake? Building a stadium from wood is one mistake that, of course, won't be repeated in the 21st century. At the new Valencia Stadium, like all other modern examples, the key building material is the most fireproof known to man, reinforced concrete. 
but to give this design iconic appeal, the team wants to clad the whole exterior in steel. And that creates a challenge because steel melts when it reaches a high enough temperature. So the project's fire engineer has to find a way of stopping the metal collapsing if fire breaks out. There are a lot of different methods you can use to protect steel. One of the methods is boarding it up with a fire-resistant boarding. That's cheap and ugly, and it doesn't go with the image of the stadium. So what we've opted for here is an intumescent paint, which, to the public, you wouldn't know that it's protected. A simple demonstration shows what this amazing flame retardant technology can do. On the right-hand side is untreated wood. In the middle, it's been painted with normal paint, which burns even faster than bare wood. But on the left-hand panel, the intumescent paint behaves differently. It expands into a layer of charcoal. Less than a millimeter's layer of paint swells to 20 times its thickness. This stops heat being conducted and stops oxygen feeding the flames. After six minutes, both the other samples are burned through and the conventional paint is releasing toxic fumes. After 45 minutes, it's total destruction for the untreated material. But the intumescent paint not only keeps the wood from burning, it's still cool enough to touch on the back. Valencia's steel work will be protected by intumescent paint for up to two hours at its most vulnerable points. But as well as the steel, and the concrete, the stadium needs a material for its roof, and choosing the wrong one could have fatal consequences. One of the main causes of death at Bradford came from above the fleeing crowd. A wooden framework had been coated with something even more combustible, bitumen. It caught fire with horrifying speed, released toxic fumes, and dripped burning tar onto people's heads. As well as something fireproof, the Valencia design calls for a material that's lightweight and stylish. The architect's choice sounds dangerously flammable. It's a kind of plastic, polytetrafluoroethylene, or PTFE for short. But Jay Parrish and the Arab team have used a similar plastic before to cover the whole of this stadium in Munich. Locals call the Alliance Arena the rubber dinghy. Shared by two different teams, the whole thing changes color according to which is playing. This chameleon skin is made of airfill bubbles of ETFE, a close relative of the plastic planned for Valencia's roof. When the material was first proposed, the Munich Fire Department responded with a long list of safety rules that the plastic would break. So the engineers had to set up an elaborate series of tests to prove that their plastic wouldn't be dangerous if fire broke out. There's a bit of a misconception about, uh, about the concept of an ETFE roof. It's almost like cling film. If anyone's ever used cling film to, uh, to put over, over bowls of food, if you ever put a match underneath, it, underneath a piece of stretched cling film, what happens to it is it punches a hole straight through the cling film and the cling film melts away from the ignition source. Exactly the same thing happens with ETFE in a roof. As soon as it gets hot enough in the middle, and it actually it's about 200 degrees Celsius, and the ETFE will melt and shrink away from the ignition source. And it will continue doing so as the fire builds. The roof material vaporizes, giving the fire nothing to feed on, so it can't take hold as it did at Bradford. The plastic had passed its test. And when it opened in 2006, the Munich Arena was rated one of the best stadiums in the world for fire safety. It's an achievement Valencia's new stadium is determined to equal. But the absence of fireproof materials wasn't the only reason so many people died at Bradford. Nearly all of the 56 who perished had been trapped in the burning stand. Why couldn't they escape? 4,000 fans had tried to get out at once, but whichever direction they fled, they found obstacles in their way. To reach the most obvious place of safety, the pitch, those in the seats, 
had to jump down one wall and climb over another. Hundreds of other people instead tried to get out the way they'd come in. They knew that beyond the corridor at the back of the stand lay the safety of the street. But they found that doors and turnstiles had been locked to stop people without tickets coming in. Only at the end furthest from the fire was there a single open exit. Of the 56 people who died, the largest number died in that top corridor, near the turnstiles or near the gates that were not open. Stadiums built after Bradford have to make sure the crowd can evacuate before the fire becomes a danger to them. So although Valencia aims to pull in huge crowds, as important to its design is the speed they can get out. At full capacity, the stadium would have 73,500 people in it. We've designed the evacuation system to get that full population out within seven and a half minutes. The 48,000 people in the middle and upper tiers will be served by over 150 exit staircases and ramps. The rest can exit at any point around the stadium, straight into a wide concrete concourse. All then get out to the street from any of 24 exterior stairs. The key thing is to maintain a fluid flow and get people out, out of the stadium quickly. The challenge for engineers is to make precise predictions about evacuation time while dealing with unpredictable human beings. So crowd behaviour from real situations like Bradford has been studied intensely and has now been fed into computer simulations. These can help fire engineers test their evacuation plans. We're now in a position where we can use predictive tools to assess what kind of uh, incidents could occur in the future. The first aspect that we consider is means of escape, which is extremely important for stadiums, obviously, because of the number of people that we have around there. Probably the most densely populated buildings in the world, um, and all these people have to get out. It may seem incredible that a machine could ever predict the behavior of real people. But this software is so sophisticated, it actually gives individual members of the crowd different personalities. What we always do is make sure that the people that we're modelling includes people who've got reduced ambulance, people who might be a little bit older, people with children. What you see uh, in, in this particular situation is people that are unhappy with their particular, uh, their particular position in the queue. Generally, eight minutes is the bar that we won't exceed uh, because people start to get a little bit agitated and not really to like to queue more than eight minutes. Of course, the longer it takes people to get out, the bigger a fire will become and the greater the danger. So the engineers have to predict not only how people will behave, but also how the flames and smoke will behave. This is a recent project, which is actually modeling a concert scenario. So we, we've, we've modeled a, a very large fire on a stage, and we have a, we have a domed roof over the top, which is containing all, all the smoke inside the stadium. And everything inside that layer is, is, is basically deadly. The highest person in this bowl is sat just up at this point here. So what we have to ensure is that these people have got enough time to evacuate before conditions in the bowl become dangerous for them. The interaction between crowd and structure is at the very heart of stadium design and of stadium disasters. It's what makes stadiums unique. They're not just concrete and steel, they're also flesh and blood. No other type of structure packs so many people so close together for such an extended period of time. But when individuals turn into a crowd, unstoppable forces can be unleashed. So above all else, stadium design has to manage the dynamics and dangers of crowds. It's a lesson that was learned the hard way at the first major stadium disaster of the modern era. When it opened in 1900, the Ibrox Park Stadium for Glasgow Rangers was the largest purpose-built football stadium in the world, with a capacity of 80,000. Two years later, the ground was packed out for an international match between Scotland and England. Suddenly, something gives way on the terracing and people fall there, describe it later, like through a trapdoor. And they don't just fall 
down, down, down onto the ground. They've banged their heads, one guy is hanging by his foot. Some people fall down onto the concrete below and are killed not by their fall, but by people falling on top of them. 26 people died. More than 500 were injured. The terraces that shattered were built from wood, supported by steel. But the engineer seemed to have made some mistakes in his calculations. What he had not properly factored in was the live load, the people it had to carry. And the timber beams were stressed not just by the weight of those people, but by the force of that crowd's movement. Shortly before the stand broke, there had been a surge of fans straining to get a better view of the Scottish team. For most large structures, human activity is actually insignificant. Much more important when designing a bridge or a skyscraper is the dead load, the weight of the building materials. The biggest task is making sure the structure can support its own weight. But Ibrox made it clear that stadiums face unique engineering challenges, which is why a few years later, the designers of London's new Wembley Stadium tested their live load calculations by inviting a crowd of human guinea pigs along before the opening. Over the decades, engineers have become increasingly knowledgeable about how materials and designs will withstand live loads. But collapses have occurred more recently. In 1991, 17 people died and 2,000 were injured when a temporary stand in Corsica collapsed. Just like at Ibrox, the stand simply didn't have enough supporting cross joists for the number of people it was expected to carry. And in 2007, a three-metre hole opened up in an upper terrace of a concrete stadium in Salvador, Brazil. Soccer fans plunged 15 metres to the street below. Eight of them died. These beams are destined to hold up the middle seating tier of this stunning new sports stadium being built in Valencia, southern Spain. But although this reinforced concrete can easily cope with a load of 800 kilograms per square metre, a crowd weighing a lot less could still threaten its structural stability. When you look at them, you think, well, how on earth could you get something that's as big as that and as massive as that to, to actually move at all? You know, if I, if I jump up and down on it, it doesn't really do a lot. But the top tier of this stand in Nuremberg, Germany, clearly is moving, and alarmingly. It's because the crowd is jumping in rhythm, bouncing at the exact rate per second that triggers the reinforced concrete structure to vibrate as well. Every element of the building has its own natural frequency. If you, if you hit it hard enough, it will oscillate at that frequency, a little bit like a string on a guitar, for instance. The problem affects an overhanging balcony, cantilevered seating tiers. The lack of any supporting pillars underneath makes it more sensitive to crowd movement. In 2000, the vibration problem was noticed at a major European stadium. Next tonight, the fears about safety, which have closed part of Liverpool's Anfield ground. The movement caused by excited Celtic fans jumping up and down in the recently extended upper tier led to urgent safety checks. As Anfield underwent emergency building works, engineers were beginning to realise that longer cantilevers were particularly at risk. So the Millennium Stadium in Cardiff, which opened around the same time, had reason to be worried. It features some of the longest cantilevered stands in the world, up to 14 metres unsupported. What really caused the engineers sleepless nights is that it regularly hosts huge concerts. And music is more likely to get people moving in rhythm. Experts fear dancing could lead to disaster, even though the vibrations couldn't cause the stand to collapse. As people jump up and down, so that stand will start to bounce. Now, structurally, it's very sound, it's stable, it's not gonna fall down. But the 15,000 people who are actually on the stand as it bounces up and down don't know that. And the concern is, of course, they may well panic, they may rush to an entrance, there'll be trips and falls, and that's where the injuries will occur. So any disaster would be caused by fear of a collapse rather than a complete structural failure. A crowd could never jump forcefully enough to actually break a modern stand. But for the people underneath, 
it would still look like the roof is falling in. So to reassure them, uh, what you do is you put these props down and actually it stops the building from moving. So it reduces the amount of flex in the floor and therefore the people are reassured. The Millennium Stadium was fitted with 54 of these hydraulic dampers. Kept tucked away during sporting events, they're brought out when the arena switches to concert mode. It takes about five days, three-man crew, so it's a very labour-intensive job. It's an effective but low-tech solution. To avoid this time-consuming work, the team have decided that not all musicians require extra structural support. People like Rod Stewart, uh, the Eagles, I mean, they're quite sedate bands, quiet. People tend to listen to the music and not move around. No, look at Oasis, U2, Coldplay, different kettle of fish. I mean, that's a really active crowd. And as well as being hard work to put up, the columns block the view from some seats. The new Valencia Stadium doesn't want these problems with pillars, so the designers have returned to cantilevered balconies. Their solution to the risk of vibration is to strengthen the structure at key points. What we do is actually model how it will react to people jumping up and down, and that gives us a more efficient design because it allow, allows us to place stiffness exactly where it's required in the structure. But building structures strong enough to bear the load of a crowd is only part of the engineer's challenge. They also have to design structures that will manage and control crowds, because above all, the crowd needs protection from itself. What's being built here today is a lot of leading edge engineering. It may seem pretty complex, but actually it's not the biggest challenge for us. The biggest challenge is how do we deal with all the people, and in particular, the behavior of crowds. The most dramatic and visible challenge posed by a crowd is when a small minority deliberately causes trouble. Hooliganism has in fact rarely led directly to deaths in sports stadiums. But there was one terrible occasion when it did. May the 29th, 1985. Italian team Juventus were playing England's Liverpool in the European Soccer Cup final at the Heysel Stadium in Belgium. Among the supporters of both clubs were gangs of hooligans. Throughout the day, these gangs had been fighting with each other and the police. Shortly before the match was due to start, a group of Liverpool hooligans charged into a Juventus area of the ground. Italian fans beat a retreat in panic, but they ended up trapped in a lethal crush. Some desperately started to clamber over a high wall, but the wall collapsed under the pressure. In the crush and the chaos, a total of 39 people were killed. Politicians and police were determined to stamp out football violence. Stadiums were redesigned to keep rival fans away from each other and off the pitch. We went through an era when the solution that people proposed in many parts of the world was to say, well, if we have a problem with people causing violence, they'd shut them away in pens so that we can control them. High fences appeared at many grounds, some topped with razor wire. Fans hated them. That's nothing to do with safety. That was a way of saying, you are a potential problem, we're going to cage you in. Fencing was a crude design solution to a complex social problem and led directly to the worst stadium disaster in Western European history. The Hillsborough Stadium in Sheffield, England, was chosen as a neutral ground for a big competition match between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest on the 15th of April, 1989. The stadium featured a typical anti-hooligan design. High fences divided the terraces up into pens and protected the pitch from possible invasion. But well before the three o'clock kickoff, the central pens at Liverpool's end of the ground were becoming dangerously overcrowded. In these two pens, people were just absolutely jammed together. By the 20 to three, it was already twice the safe 
safety certificate number. One of the people caught in the crush was 17-year-old Gary Burns. You just assume that then somebody would say, well, right, that pen's full, shut it off. And then it started getting more uncomfortable. And then you suddenly realised that you couldn't move. You were pinned to one position. If you hear a woman screaming like you, you think, well, someone's going to come and help in a moment, because there were people obviously in distress, there were people shouting out for help, but there was no one there. Unaware of the problems inside, other fans were still trying to get into the overcrowded terraces. But because only a tiny number of entrances had been allocated for 10,000 ticket holders, a dangerous crush had formed outside as well. The guy outside radio in and said, I'm, I'm seriously worried about injuries, possibly even worse than that out here. The, it, there's no way we're going to get these people into the ground anywhere near the kickoff. Frustration is rising. At five to three, to relieve the bottleneck, police made a fatal mistake. They opened a wide gate that was only supposed to be used for exit. Thousands of fans entered the stadium at once. No one had warned them of the situation inside. So they all headed directly to the overcrowded central pens. I want you to think here of a piston going into a chamber which is already full. Inside, people were pushed so tightly together, their lungs became compressed and they began to suffocate. And it's the weirdest feeling, so surreal of being outside in the open air with the sky above you, but you can't breathe. You'd end up gasping for breaths. There were times when you could inhale, but then the pressure would squeeze a bit more and you couldn't actually exhale. I felt in fear of my life. I thought I was going to die. As the game kicked off, thousands of spectators were fighting to stay alive. People immediately started lifting their youngsters to try and get them out of there, and people were grabbing them by the hand and pulling them out. Others were manfully trying to climb this overhanging fence. Others were actually trying to break it down. When they started trying to escape out over the perimeter fence, uh, the police interpreted this as a pitch invasion, as, as hooliganism, and, and started pushing them back. The duty of care which is actually the primary duty of the police in policing events of public nature like this. The duty of care didn't really exist in any realistic sense at all. It was all about these people are trouble. It wasn't just Liverpool, the football fans are trouble. And these are Liverpool fans, that's even worse. Too slowly, the authorities realised people were dying. Bodies everywhere, lifeless bodies. Um, bodies that seem so limp. People being carried out and put into the grass. 96 people died. More than 400 were injured. What could have led to such extreme overcrowding? The official inquiry blamed poor design, poor planning, poor management and catastrophic crowd control. And yet, tragically, Hillsborough was by no means the first stadium crowd crush, or the last. All over the world, chillingly similar disasters have occurred for the same reasons. In 1996, in a Guatemalan stadium, 76 people died at a World Cup qualifying match. Once again, most died from compressive asphyxia. The crush stopped their lungs from working. Even at Heysel, suffocation was in fact the cause of most deaths. Although hooligans had triggered the fatal stampede, no one actually died as a direct result of fighting.
the mass fatalities, the cause of death has invariably been constrictive asphyxia. That's where you, uh, you can't breathe. You, the, the, the pressure around you is so immense that you, you breathe out, you can't breathe in again. So you suffocate to death. After 30 seconds, you lose consciousness. After six minutes, you're brain dead. Attempting to prevent this horrible form of death has become the life work of Professor Keith Still. He advises everyone from Olympics organizers to the Saudi Arabian government on how to move masses safely. A mathematician by training, he's brought a scientific approach to the problems that occur when individuals turn into a crowd. Above one person per square meter, we start to behave as a crowd. Your options for choice start to become reduced. Your lines of sight become reduced. We can't take whole paces. Everyone seems to know where they're going, so we'll just follow on. It's going with the flow, in effect. At this point, individuals have become powerless to influence the crowd they're in. The whole is bigger than the sum of its parts and more dangerous. Progressive crowd collapse happens when one person falls over, he hits the ground, taking two or three with them, and then you have a wall of people. The mistake for decades was to try to blame people, like hooligans, when crowds were crushed. It's not the crowd's fault. It's a failure to control the flow. It's a failure to understand the dynamics of the crowd in those confined spaces. Assuming that the crowd can be controlled and coerced, rather than designing around the crowd's needs, was the biggest mistake in the past. At Hillsborough, overcrowding had created a force so great, it broke metal barriers. But such pressure would never be able to build up again, thanks to a change in stadium design, which took place immediately afterwards. First most visible sign of, of progress after Hillsborough was the perimeter fences started coming down. Sometimes the best engineering solutions are the simplest. Hillsborough had proved that a crowd can't look after itself. It needs to be managed. So engineers had to develop new technology for monitoring and moving people. Some of the most state-of-the-art systems in the world can be found at Anfield, the stadium of Liverpool Football Club, whose fans died in the 1989 disaster. Crucial to the design of any modern arena is something most spectators barely notice, the control room. So this is the hub of all the operation for a match day. Without this, you haven't got a stadium. This nerve center surveys the whole stadium, both visually and electronically. It's designed to make an overcrowding disaster impossible. At every turnstile, when everybody goes in, gives you an electronic pulse. So it can tell you how many people have come through that turnstile, how many people are in each area. And the idea is that's giving you a build-up as to the flows of what's coming in, so you don't end up too many people in one section. And if you did get to that number, bells would go at the turnstiles, and automatically you've got to close them. The threat of violence has been eliminated not with fences, but by identifying, arresting, and banning any troublemakers. There are 56 cameras throughout the stadium, so you can see numbers, people, movement, crowd dynamics, and any incidents. The 45,000-seater stadium also brings in a team of around 1,200 people to run each match. That's one member of staff for every 38 fans. Perhaps the most significant change to stadiums after Hillsborough was also the most unpopular with fans. At Anfield, it meant losing a feature of their ground that had become legendary. The COP once held 20,000 people, all standing on terracing. If you look at the, the pattern of disasters, of accidents, Bradford apart, they all take place on terracing. Standing terraces were regularly the site of everything from mass fainting to broken limbs, as well as deaths. But in the 1990s, all major football stadiums in the UK were forced to replace them with seated areas. Injury levels have fallen very dramatically. You know, if you're in a seat, you, you, you can't sort of rush forward so easily. 
um, when somebody scores a goal. You don't get these sort of great pile-ups at the foot of a barrier. And the same policy quickly became the norm across the world. It's compulsory for venues hosting international competition matches. A side effect was that some legendary arenas have seen their capacity slashed. Rio's mighty Maracanã once held just shy of 200,000. That's been halved to 95,000. But when it comes to saving lives, the UK's experience can't be argued with. Not one person has died in a crowd crush since the end of standing terraces there. So it's no surprise that the new Valencia Stadium will be an all-seater. If the 75,000 seats, which will soon be laid on these beams, were laid end-to-end, -end, they'd stretch for over 35 kilometres. But to be sure to prevent a crowd disaster here, the designers have to ensure people stay in their seats. What happens when the action gets really exciting? Everyone has got to have a good view of it. Otherwise, if they can't see it, they're going to stand up. And if someone in front of you stands up, you have to stand up. Here, as with every stadium, we design every row individually. We actually start from first principles, drawing what we call sight lines from the goal line or the touch line to the eye of each spectator. The designers then work out how much higher each spectator needs to be to see over the head of the person in front. The challenge for us is to make sure that everybody in the stadium has a great view. Good stadium seating ensures a win-win situation. The sports fan knows they can enjoy their game without obstructions. And the authorities know that they're managing a crowd that's much less at risk. Even though human factors are the most immediate danger stadium engineers worry about, the sheer size of these structures also makes them vulnerable to the forces of nature. Valencia's design features an eye-catching curved facade, but that creates a problem. The non-standard shape is not covered by standard regulations for wind loads. So to prove their design would be safe in a storm, a detailed scale model had to be built and placed in a wind tunnel. The fear was that sections of the facade could blow off or gusts could set off destructive vibrations. But the design passed the test. It's strong enough to withstand even a freak storm. Jay Parrish learned to anticipate natural disaster and design accordingly as part of the team who created the most ambitious stadium the world has yet seen. The designers of the Beijing Olympic Stadium feared it could be destroyed by a natural disaster, an earthquake. The devastation witnessed in Sichuan just months before the 2008 Games was a tragic reminder of the power of these seismic forces. Beijing, too, is in an active earthquake zone. If a strong shock strikes the Olympic arena, the lives of up to 91,000 spectators would be at risk. And stadiums present a unique challenge to seismic engineers. Unlike other big buildings, such as office blocks, their size is spread over a vast area. The bird's nest is over a third of a kilometre in length. During a quake, the ground beneath it would probably move differently at each end of the structure, creating a tension that could pull it to pieces. The inside of the stadium, the concrete stands, the concourses, that's been designed as a number of separate sections. So there'll be one here, there'll be another one here. And by doing that, we can allow each of them to move independently if there is an earthquake. The concrete seating bowl of the stadium has been split up into six segments. In between them, the builders have left gaps of up to two centimetres. In an earthquake, each of the sections can move individually. But the steel skeleton that gives the bird's nest its nickname couldn't be divided into separate segments. It has to stay as a continuous structure because it's self-supporting. Columns to hold it up inside would have blocked the views for spectators. 
we had to come up with a way that we could make this behave well in earthquakes. And we did that by making it entirely separate from the rest of the building. Any contact that it might have with the inside of the building is by a flexible joint. By doing this, the whole outside can move quite happily on its own. These flexible joints prevent the more rigid concrete interior tearing the steel skeleton in different directions. Steel is naturally a lighter and more flexible material than concrete. But the designers still had to make sure the component beams wouldn't break during a quake. So the project's seismic engineer decided to pit the structure against forces so great they're off the Richter scale using a computer simulation. Anything turning from blue to pink was bad news. It indicated a beam or member had broken. So many did break that the structure collapsed. But identifying exactly where this happened taught them how to make the stadium safe. By identifying the members that have been damaged completely without any strength remaining, and those have been damaged severely, we can just strengthen those members that are necessary. When the test was run again on a structure where just the few vulnerable beams had been strengthened, it didn't collapse. As a result of these tests, the real thing should be standing for many centuries to come. The most severe earthquake we have considered in our design is a very rare earthquake event, which happens once every 2,500 years. The bird's nest is just one of a new wave of hugely ambitious, eye-catching stadiums. Competing with it for the world's attention are the likes of the Sapporo Dome in Japan, which can slide its soccer pitch outdoors and swap it for a baseball field. And soon Europe's largest stadium, New Camp in Barcelona, will undergo this radical transformation and grow its capacity to 110,000 spectators. So when Valencia opens its new stadium in 2009, the designers know it must be more than just an arena for sport. It must compete with these other iconic structures and become an instantly recognizable brand for both Valencia's football team and the city. What we're looking for is to create something which is not just a building, we're looking for an icon. It's like a cathedral. It's one of the few buildings that actually has soul. But designers today are only able to concentrate on dazzling forms and guarantee spectators an exciting experience because engineers have worked so hard to solve the dangers that stadiums once presented. 21st century sports stadiums have truly been built from disaster.